Hello there, Rex. Welcome to the Art of Feeling Better podcast. You are the extra special guest. Good afternoon, or should I say good morning? Because it's morning where you are. Perfect. So that looks fabulous, Rex. <laughs> <laughs> so do you. You have a new hair look. Yes. Yes. I well, it changes like the wind. So I've decided to go, yeah. We're we're, we're sort of you with the wind. Yes. Uniform purple this week. The it's spring good. look. How are you yeah. anyway? Did you have a nice break? I had a fantastic break. I had a four-week hiatus in Southeast Asia, including Singapore, which is my old base. You know, I had done my part of my secondary school there through this GCO level back in the days when they had GCE exams. Yeah. And uh, so partly in Singapore, a couple of days in Malaysia, about a 10-week jaunt through Laos, which was my first time. I've never been to Laos. And uh, and then also to Sri Lanka and then oh. back to Singapore. So by the end, I was physically a little bit worn out because between jet lag, the hot weather, but I met a lot of old friends, met made a lot of new friends, interesting connections, going to new places and trying to learn from the people locally. Oh, it's beautiful. It's so enriching, isn't it? It's so and like you say, your body might be a little fatigued from the from moving around, but it really fills your soul up, doesn't it? You get a lot it of does. Money. And uh, I need time to decompress and really assimilate a lot of the thoughts and have a chance to dig a little bit deeper into some of them. Oh, and I think what's interesting is, of course, Singapore is so cosmopolitan and multicultural these days. And traditionally, of course, it's a Southeast Asian country with um, numerically by proportion dominant Chinese, which right. itself means a mixture of different backgrounds but in uh, and i don't want to use the term religion but spiritually it's probably more well, worshiping the big bucks these days it's all about you know the five c's in singapore cash yeah. credit card clubs country clubs <laughs> cars and condos oh but, that, that, that makes me you know, okay. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, it's a driving force of much of the world. Emblematic, you can substitute little bits and pieces elsewhere. Yeah, it is. And I think that's that's exactly part of the problem, exactly why, you know, why I wanted to catch up and chat with you today. So in uh, on the other hand, in Laos, which is of course a also an old country, and bits of it goes back to Uncle Wat, the um Yeah, Uncle the, Wat, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To the fifth century AD yeah. and all. I'm an era. I'd love and to be more modern times. There's a lot of Buddhism. And it was so. really interesting to see in the morning. One of the things to do in a place called Luang Prabang is to get up in the morning quite early at about 4 30 or 5, 5 30. By 5 45, 6 p.m., the, the monks are parading through the streets to collect their alms coming up from the temples. And this is a tradition. Wow. They only have two meals a day. They have breakfast and they have lunch. And largely the food they eat is what they collect from people's sort of charitable givings, philanthropy. But part of the giving is giving back, really, because mm -hmm. the monks in their pursuit are doing good things, you know. Yeah. They're, and also it's interesting. Some of the young monks are as young as 8 to 11 years old. So it's really an initiation. They're called novice monks. And it affords opportunity for otherwise poor country kids. Sometimes maybe their parents cannot afford to feed them even, and certainly not, not to educate them, to get them two square meals a day, a solid education, which includes the basics, reading, arithmetic, and so forth, but mm -hmm. also now a bit of uh, spiritual teaching in the Buddhist text and so forth. And then, of course, they have to give back service. Yeah, it's exchange, so, isn't it? It's being of service. Yeah, it really is an exchange. They learn how to serve. They learn how to serve 
the community. And I think it comes back to learning to serve oneself, but in a positive, more self-compassionate, but at the same time, maybe less self-centered, if that makes sense. You know, you're actually yeah. uh, developing self-compassion, but in a way of not self-pity, the two are not the same, but yeah. also much less self-centered. It's about a sense of service. And I think in modern society, very often we've lost these initiation rites where there's a common bond. Now we can delve into the details and say, but this is only for males. Same with when I was with Anthony Willoughby in Kenya, the initiation rites for teenagers, that's primarily for the males. The women are left out. But I think we can really broaden the search for some, oh, what uh, Anthony would call primary knowledge that we should reinstitute but yeah. it needs structure yes it does and that's the that's the difficulty isn't it with so much wisdom to share it's trying to to get some focused action into structure because i agree with you the world it's we've lost our way completely haven't we we've lost uh, what it means to be human and i think from for me from my experience my whole life really has been instinctively about being of service in in whichever way i can but then I think I, I spent many years in my 20s going across the line the other way and self-sabotaging and being very much from my own kind of childhood issues, not valuing myself in the way I should. So it's, 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 it's learning balance, isn't it? And someone has to teach that, mm -hmm. share that wisdom, self-compassion, self-respect, self-worth, but from a place that then enables you to be of service to your community and gives you strength and power so that everyone can be healthy and happy and share and it sounds so like common sense, but it seems to be such a big thing for us to try and achieve, doesn't it? And you're a physician, aren't you? So if you do you yes, mind a bit of a background so that so that listeners, when we put the recording out, um, know a little bit about your background, because I know health is a huge topic. And I am so grateful for your time chatting with me because I'm so interested in functional medicine and, and the holistic approach and and trying to work out where we've gone so wrong. And you picked up on something when we were chatting with Anthony a while ago around the patients that you see constantly in your in your in your working life and in the ER, ER room presenting with things that really don't need the kind of um medicine that you would give in the hospital and and I I really I'd love to to hear a bit more about your your kind of background as a physician and, and what you think about that sure I think in a way so first my background I tell people I'm from back east and of course, living in the United States, where I've been for the last 47, 48 years, people assume, oh, it must be Boston or New York or Washington. And I tell them, no, I was born in Hong Kong. Really? So like yourself, at least one time, I was a subject of Her Majesty when Absolutely. Hong Kong was part of the greater British Empire, whatever that means also. But we'll leave that discussion for another day. But then my parents removed to Singapore when I was around 10, 11, 12. And my formative years were spent in Singapore in the middle school years when we're beginning to ask those big hidden meaning questions of lives, of who I am, of what's my purpose, of where I'm going, and so on and so forth. Cutting short, then my parents sent me to New Hampshire, New okay. England, to study for high school, to finish high school. So I finished high school and I also did my college in New England in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Okay. And from there, then I moved west because my parents had by then decided to immigrate since the kids were not going back to the Far East. So I did my medical training at UCLA, University of California in Los Angeles. A whole bunch of my clinical trainings were also at UCLA and finishing off at UC San Francisco in pulmonary and critical care. And for the first, so I would say about 20 years of my medical career, I was very much focused on oh, doing the academic thing, getting to the best white elephant that I can. So I was at University of Southern California. And for the last 15 years of my academic career, I was at Johns Hopkins on the East Coast. Hence, it's some truth I am from back East these days. Yeah. Although I'm fairly, as you know, nomadic. Yes. And right now, as we speak, I'm talking to you from California, from the Bay Area. Are you? Okay, lovely. I'm still doing some consultation work. And uh, so my focus had been going from the very, very broad medicine to the very, very narrow pulmonary critical care, thoracic oncology, lung cancer diagnostics, 
So for about 15 years, I was focusing on thoracic oncology at Hopkins. But then along the way, I sort of realized that medicine can become, and I really enjoyed what I did, interacting with people from around the world. The name helps. And I was doing a lot of uh, procedures called bronchoscopy, endoscopy, making diagnosis of infections or very often tumors in the airways and doing some therapeutics, keeping things open. So definitely helping the individual. But then I also realized so much of our modern medicine have become very dollar short and a day late, prescriptive <laughs> in giving medications, this and that. But when we think this is saying that in the West or at least in America, we work very hard for a long time to save up a little money so that towards the end of life, we can spend a lot of money to buy a little time, sometimes right. not a very high quality. Yeah. And when I think about the diseases I see both as a lung cancer specialist, i.e. smoking related diseases and not putting blame, mind you, but smoking, of course, causes not just lung cancer, but people with emphysema and also heart disease. And similarly, when we look at common conditions, that's still causing the majority of deaths and the lots of suffering along the way. It's things such as diabetes, high blood pressure, kidney failure, and the effects of what we call diseases of despair. Think alcoholism, think drug substance misuse, and again, smoking of all different sorts. And a lot of it really comes out of not the disease process, which is very interesting, different physiology and pathophysiology, but perhaps the biggest mystery of all is why we fall prey. Mm. Yeah. Now, going from a condition where early in medical school, I thought, well, psychiatry is interesting. They always say, well, if you walk into a room and the hair stands up at the back of your neck, you know, there's some true psychopathology in the room. But I think most of us have psychopathology that are not hair raising to the extent, but day in, day out, how do we sabotage ourselves? How do we sabotage relationships? And that goes back a lot to who we are, what's our identity, and how do we help people develop the right identity, if you will? I shouldn't say right, because sometimes there's no single right, is there? But how do we help people regain a sense of self with compassion towards self and towards others? and uh, move forward without a causing harm. Because our first dictum in medicine, the old Hippocratic Oath, and this is true, out, true actually in all different cultures, is so-called primum non nocere, which in Latin means first do no harm. So how do we go about first do no harm, and then think about how to maintain health, the wellness, the primary prevention, and when necessary, how do we regain health out of illness? So I hope that gives you a broad scope. So my certainly interests and what competence I have, quickly losing them, I suppose. Never. <laughs> no, no, we evolve. We do. It's uh, in healthcare and in health issues. And so I strive to every day learn something new. And there's so much to learn, isn't it? I love that about you, Rex, as well. Immediately, I could get that from you that you just having such an academic background and such a lot of experience within a, you know, a very technical field, um, it, it would be easy for you to get ingrained in one, in one school of thought and then fail to look at any different perspectives. But, you know, you really just, I mean, you've, you've um, you know, come across my own program, my mindset mojo program around disease, dis-ease for me, it's all, it's environmental. That is it for me. I think a lot of especially the work that I do and I work a lot with addiction um, of all types and just really yeah. people suffering in a multitude of ways, whether that's overwork or just dissatisfied and ill at ease with their lives and the physical symptoms that they're manifest in time. If that's not seen to obviously send people to the emergency room and send people to their GPs when if we bring it back to the roots and actually start to help people to uncover, as you say, uncover who they really are and what matters to them and their own metrics of success and a life well lived, then I think for me, that's how we can make the changes and, and do that compassionately and empathically. Um, so I, I, I love the fact that somebody like myself who presents in this way, and I'm wildly creative in Wales doing some 
pushing buttons and having interesting conversations and working in a very sort of spiritual and holistic way you can have a really deep conversation with a physician you know over over in the United States and a really pa- really powerful conversations without any kind of you know nobody needing to be right or wrong or conflict right. it's right. Wisdom, isn't it it's just sharing experience and wisdom and and that's the essence of the institute of primary knowledge the, the thing that we're trying to bring together how can we share that wisdom in a way that's accessible for everybody that is um there's no pressure and there's no doctrine and there's no kind of judgment that's that's the that's the interesting topic isn't it how do we do that yeah i think it's a beautiful uh, idea a recognition that we all bring value even though our background may be different whether it be academic non-academic but we all have some lived experience now some seem to gain it sooner than others of my three children anna the youngest we talk of her as being boy she is sort of a good wisdom even as a child you know yes the old soul yes although when you know, so it's good for change. We actually honor the term old. Yes, I think, of course, in society, everything is focusing on the new, on the technology, on the AI, and forgetting the sort of part of it is, I think, a revival of the slow movement, isn't it? And at the core of all this, not just slow food, slow eating, slow conversation, slow talks, but I think it is the idea that we need to go back and regain some sense that there is great value in slowing everything down because key in that slowness is mindfulness. It's hard to be mindful when we're trying to multitask and rush along the day to catch deadlines only because we've overbooked things, overcommitted things. And uh, so I think key to much is really the concept of mindfulness, which I know is a little bit squishy woo woo for a lot of people. But I think just we have to be conscious of our being. Yes, we are human beings, aren't we? Not human doings. We are. No, my we life's are. work is to is to bring the woo woo into the room. That's my life's work is to kind of translate that difficult language that people don't resonate with and try to kind of mediate that and bring those concepts. Because being present, you know, being mindful and and without judgment, it's just the most powerful and healing thing that we can do. We just lost our way in how to do it. And we're either, you know, we're either ruminating about the past or we are panicking about the future and we we just can't stay still in our present space. And that makes me really sad. And I, I experience it myself all the time. But I think when you have a bit of knowledge on how that works and you have a little bit of a toolkit, then you can you you can you can practice and it's a practice, isn't it? Yes, I love the idea of a toolkit. And for most of us, we actually have it. It's how to learn how to sharpen the tools, to use them, to know their purpose. And I think part of this consciousness raising is self to develop some sense of purpose, some sense of self, and how to regain a sense of identity. And when I think of the social ills at the individual level, at the family level, at the community level, at the national level, at the international level, it's the sense of having lost the ability to communicate in an open way. But to communicate, we have to connect. And to connect, we have to know a little bit about who we are. And I do feel that there's been a great loss of identity. Too much of an identification of identity as your job, as your education, as your socioeconomic class, what type of house, what type of car you're living in, What's your appearance on TikTok and Facebook and Instagram? The whole sense of focusing on what you fear you're missing out instead of being thankful and appreciative of what we have. And of course, we can all be so thankful for what we do have, even in dark times. And I think it's regaining that recognition, again, the mindfulness that what we have is in us already. And so again, even in my recent trips, it is so interesting in a place like Laos, which again, it's landlocked in Southeast Asia. It's a one landlocked country. Vietnam on one side on its east, Thailand and Burma on the west, a bit of Cambodia to the south, and maybe or maybe not a bit of China to the north. So it's the poorest country by far. It's landlocked, it's agrarian. It has lots of potential, 
but uh, it's floundering under a government that I will say on air, my sense is very corrupt, lots of leakage. And yet at the individual level, there's a certain grace by so many people who otherwise we would look at them and say, boy, they've got nothing. They're in the village, they're in the country, they're making a simple living, they're fishing, they're farming. And yet there's a real sense of self and belonging, yeah. of this identity that I think partly it's cultural and historic, but very much comes back to none of us, the whole concept, it's so true. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to support an individual. So I think losing the community is one of the big challenges and how to rebuild community. And it doesn't have to be a huge community. It could be a community of two or three, but it's all around us. Yeah, but I think- we do need Sorry, go on. go on. No, no, it's just that we do need community, even though, you know, we all also need alone time. It, and it's essential. It's part of the, um, the list of human needs. So I've been doing a little bit of training with the Human Givens Institute around the nine emotional needs that, that we need to survive, not just to be happy, but actually for survival. And community is one and um, time alone is another. And, and I think that they are the things that we've lost because we've been too busy striving for you know, technological advancement and trying to perform and achieve. And we have definitely lost our way. And I think you're right. It's about an excavation, isn't it? It's about re rediscovering and finding what we already have that we've kind of lost our way with. But I also do think you're right, because I've over the years since I've run my my not for profit, we've done lots of work with groups and, and I instinctively knew that community was had to be a focus. So I've I've spent a lot of years building various communities, but I've recognized in the last probably two years that it, it's not enough to do that because people are so lost that the identity thing is the big barrier that the labels provides a real difficulty because we can bring people together and try and form a community and hold space and facilitate but each person is so embroiled in their sort of nervous system response 24 7 that they're trying to look for where to fit in and what label would you like me to have and what's the right thing to say so it still isn't conducive to what we're trying to achieve so I think you hit the nail on the head before reflecting on my work. I think the individual identity and supporting that individual awareness of who you are, what matters to you, cultivating the ability to manage yourself and not look externally for validation or for fixing and experience life in its you know good and bad and actually stand in your own truth authentically and, and understand and appreciate who you are, what lights you up, what brings you joy, what you feel your contribution should be. And then bringing the people together that have those tools, for me, that's the magic. That's when community really lights up because everybody has their autonomy and everyone has, they come to the table already with a strong sense of self. So they're not trying to fit in or prove themselves or compete. They just are. They just are. You know their being well we're seeing the same thing you're seeing in much better than i am <laughs> i think no i just as you know i just kind of it comes out without my uh <laughs> without my uh yeah me thinking about it but you know that's just my authentic <laughs> reflections and feelings <laughs> i think it needs to it's it's both isn't it it's the individual and the community it has to be a in tandem we got to do that and, and do you think from your thinking about your medical background, because this really and I have no knowledge, it's not my background at all. I have sweeping assumptions that I make from what I would see on the TV and from the people I work with and, and from my own life. But the I'd love to know a percentage of the, the people that are presenting with, you know, physical illness and, as you say, blood pressure issues and kidney disease and, and all of these things, how preventable that would be without any kind of intervention. If, if people had access earlier in their lives to this kind of approach and these kind of tools, you know, whether we've cut, we've cut the head off the body, haven't we? We treat, we treat the symptoms as they come up and plaster them over, but we don't connect the fact that there is something in there that could sort all of this crap out if we just learn how to do it. What's, right, your, right. what's your perspective on that? <clears throat> I think it's hard, Jane, to put a specific number to the percentage I'd rather approach it in a sense that maybe because in a community it's an it's a bell curve or it's a number by modal curves, isn't it? So depending on the disease condition, depending on the part of the community, some of it is socioeconomic, 
But then if we look at Western Europe or Western society, access to care is so different between the UK, which is much more uniform, or Scandinavia, <clears throat> the Western liberal democracies, which I do adhere to as a good model, versus the US, the richest country in the world, and yet on a lot of metrics of health outcomes, such as childhood mortality and so forth, it ranks overall in the 20s or 30s. That's because the distribution is so multimodal. You have the wealthy who have the best of access to the Stanfords and the Harvards and the Hopkins. And then you have everyone, everyday people who may be working two jobs or unemployed and with no access to health care at all in the same city. Oh, excuse me. Wow. Oh. I apologize. <laughs> you thought I had a duck next to me, yeah, picking me up, say, dog. feed me, daddy. Yeah, I right? thought I had a duck with Because you. otherwise, sometimes in a crowd, the phones all sound the same. That's brilliant. So I guess I am a mouth disruptor and yeah. not that I want to stand out, but often I find out uh, that I'm a little bit off in the corner the in terms of my point of view. <laughs> yeah. The duck but anyway, the carry on. of health, wellness and outcome and so on, if someone asks me, so Doc, how do I stay healthy and happy or well into an older age? Mm -hmm. I would... Uh, Jokingly say, the first thing is, I hope you picked your parents well. Yeah, yeah I get that, yeah. Meaning genetics. So cool. nature does play a role. So your genes you inherit can bless you with longevity because in trying to promote good health habits, there's always someone who say, aha, but I have my uncle Charlie who smoked three packs, drank two pints, it also is all the unmentionables. And look, he's 99 and a half. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> scratch the body. Well, yeah. Charlie had good luck and good genes. But then beyond the nature, of course, comes the nurture. And the nurturing comes in several forms. One of it is, of course, developing the knowledge. And even with the knowledge, we can give everyone the best knowledge and indoctrinate in a positive way health healthy lifestyles, types of ways to eat, to sleep enough, to be engaging, not to delve into bad habits and so on and so forth. But then do you practice it? Yeah, and can you practice it? Have you, have, have you got an environment that allows you? Yeah. The practicalities of are you afforded the time to be mindful, to take a break, that you don't have to work two jobs to mm -hmm. support yourself and your family and live hand to mouth. So these are all different issues. But I think all in all, still, the part that we do have somewhat better control is in developing a certain sense of self-awareness of mm -hmm. self. And when you have a strong, stronger sense of self, of course, we need three squares a day or two squares a day, a roof over our head, not to feel cold, to feel the sense of being safe, yeah. being well cared for, being loved, that there's possibilities. These things are all very important. But then why do people not participate? And I would say it depends. Depends on the hospital I'm working at, depends on the location and the type of hospital, the type of patients. Very different in a veteran's uh, military hospital where unfortunately there's a lot more PTSD these days. Recognizing in America, more soldiers, ex-soldiers die from suicide than actually on the battlefield. And I dare say the same may be true in the UK as well, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So again, how do we prevent? Some of it is prevention. Some of yeah. it is providing the right nurturing and support throughout. So in a sense, it's no different from being in a family. Mm -hmm. So as a rough percentage, however, I would say for chronic diseases like COPD, emphysema, with smoking being the primary driver, some of the lung diseases being secondary to poor exposure to different carcinogens of mineral dust fibers, heart disease, more and more due to obesity, diabetes, which is linked to obesity, and realizing they overlap. You so if the heart disease is bad enough if you have a congenital history of heart disease, but then you're stressed, so you have high blood pressure. You don't eat well, so you have high cholesterol. You don't eat well, so you end up with diabetes. You get the picture. And then yeah. On top of that, you smoke. So yeah, suddenly, a crappy you're life, so you drink and smoke because you can't deal with it. You know, you've got a crap life, so I'm going to smoke right, and drink because right. it's the only way I feel better. And then that adds to the problem. Yeah. Well, but that's, of course, part of the issue is 
Is it the only way? And how do we provide people with the right toolkits, as you mentioned, to redirect their ability to say, I'm not I'm not the victim of circumstances only. It may be unfortunate victim of the overall environment, but how why are there always success stories? But this is, however, not to say that we do not need to have policies that support the average person, the better society. Hmm. And there are so many topics we can delve on, where you are in the socioeconomic spectrum, from education and so forth. Yeah, there's a lot. The have nots and a widening gap that makes people upset and angry. But I think this is as important a time as ever. I have children. I believe you have children also. Have and so you have four. Whoa, You're yeah. a busy mom. Busy lady. Well, they're all older now, so they're kind of they're leaving. Oh, the I see. So, yeah. Well, you must have done tremendously well not to have age through having four children yes. and probably had joy having them. Yeah, do you know what? I, I think that's what it comes down to is having and people say it's interesting because it relates to what you're saying. A lot of it's a it's a mindset thing, isn't it? I think a lot of the time because I, I tend to get people will say, well, it's okay for you. You're lucky. And I think, well, is it luck? I've had a lot of challenges in my life. I've had an awful lot of grief and trauma. And I've, you know, I've been through childbirth four times. I've raised four children and we have the same challenges and difficulties as everybody else I come across. But I, it's a different way of dealing with things. And the gratitude you mentioned before, I think it's really difficult, really difficult when you're in the middle of a horrible circumstance to try and pull out the learning and be grateful for the experience itself, as well as the things that you have. Right, right, right. For me, I think that's that's what it is. I mean, I started early. I was 19, no, 20 when I had Callum, and he's 25 this year. So. Wow, wow, wow. And the baby, yeah. who's now six foot, he's 16, and then we've got two girls in the middle, so... But yeah, it's mm. and it's a journey, isn't it? You're the same. You've got children. It's you know the journey of parenthood, being a you know having a partner, being a someone's spouse, all the labels that you put on. It's and, and it's keeping your own identity within that mix as well. Is the is a difficult bit. And I think the right conversations are so important, and we can't keep putting them off because they're uncomfortable. So I, I'd love to do more of these kind of conversations, and hopefully by recording them. When we get a bit further down the line with, with setting up a space, you know, the Institute of Primary Knowledge that Anthony is, is passionate about, we'll have this set of resources as yes. a good starting point to, to, to have some conversations. I've been speaking to somebody, in fact, just, just before I, I came on with you, speaking to an amazing lady called Valerie around education. So we're doing a big piece of work around the education system. Health is another topic. All kinds of different enriching conversations that are relevant to every person. And even if they can be uncomfortable, great, brilliant, because that's where the learning happens. It's it's being able to sit in that space, isn't it, with the with the topics that are contentious. Um, yeah. Happen regardless. I, well, part of so what drives a lot of my thinking and decision making is what would be best, not just for me, for my bank account for now, but what would be best for my kids generation and their generations beyond and i think one of the uncomfortable thought for instance is as i said so many people in the current generation tie their identity to their occupation if they have an occupation and face it with our children it is said that on average to have two to five different careers a couple of which may not have been invented mm. and i think the concept of whether or not it's ai chat gpt generative AI, robotics, of taking away jobs, which will be very real. Yeah. So that in the future, I think unless we're preparing our generations beyond and ourselves, ourselves who are vital in our work, we feel that we're in the prime of our lives and so forth, but we may be made redundant quite quickly by technology. So if you lose your job and your identity at age 45, you become despondent at one end, angry at the other, and all this is very dysfunctional. And what is your so purpose? Think, what is your purpose? Yeah. Point. What's your purpose exactly? So I think part of the purpose is to repurpose ourselves, be prepared to learn new things. So learning something new every day, and you know, being practical in our learning somewhat, but not only in learning technical skills, but I think in reading history and reading the arts developing the right side of the brain and not just the left-sided brain as us STEM scientists types tend to do. Vital. Vital. I think, yeah, vital to make those connections within us as well 
not just between us. And uh, I'll finish off by saying that I heard something very interesting from a current German philosopher I met. I won't tell you how, you know, it was in Delphi, Greece at an arts festival. And this was a couple of years ago. So very often we all feel like the world, our world is on the verge of collapse. And when we think back historically, while reflecting a little more the Judeo-Christian tradition, we talk about four horsemen of the apocalypse, don't we? And you can take the Old Testament version, the New Testament version variation, they're all the same. And I'm sure in other different cultures, they have the equivalent four or five horsemen, right, of the apocalypse. And they are used to be famine, pestilence, war, and something called, at least in the Old Testament version, wild beasts, which I think, hmm, I interpret this, is it black swan events or is it the bad personalities? Bad, I'm using a pejorative, the dysfunctional yeah. personalities. Now, nothing is good about any of these. We cannot say that famine or pestilence is a good idea or war is a good idea. But Christoph Quarsh, this philosopher, said that, think the four modern horsemen of the modern apocalypse are thus. Technism, everything is driven by technical advances. Dataism or dataism, everything about harvesting data for big AI or, you know, generative GPT and so forth. Robotics, of course, being uh, technism. The third is everything is determined and prioritized by economism. Is it going to make money? Is it going to be balancing the budget up front? And a fourth is something he called transhumanism, which is an interesting concept. I think it's like leaving behind the humanistic qualities because we can control everything now. And so I thought, hmm, this is very interesting because unlike the old four horsemen where nothing can be said, good to, can be said about pestilence, famine, and so forth, we use technical advances every day. Robots have made maybe manufacturing better. Self-driving cars can be potentially safer. But what does it do for the humankind when it's the idea is the priority is towards economism and priority is losing our humanity. So I thought that was a sort of telling, challenging thought about where we are and where we could be going and how we make our decisions on a daily basis. Hopefully we have decent leaders, but we each have to lead ourselves. And then of course, the responsibility of careful selection of who our leaders are and so forth. So it makes it, because things are moving faster, so it makes it all the more of a priority that we devote time and attention to become more wise in our own capacity. We cannot depend on, you know, TikTok or on social media to tell us what is right or wrong or to guide us. It's really the cart leading the horse. Yeah, and that's the frightening part for me because I'm fascinated by transhumanism. I think the whole, same as you, the whole concept, it just everything interests me. I love to learn. It really fascinates me. And I can, again, see both sides of the coin. I can see the good and I can see the bad. So, so, you know, mindset mojo, the, the psychology and the mental health is one part and it's based on the medicine wheel. So we then have mm -hmm. some statistics and we have body, you know, body focused things and spiritual development and emotional development. And I was talking in my recording, sort of introducing it around blending the old with the new. And I think that's the way. I mean, I'm I'm a shamanic practitioner. My heart and my soul is based in the old ways and, and nurturing and building in the old ways and respect and connection to nature, to, to the space we live in, to, to being human. But I recognize that we can't go backwards either. We can't go back to live as the old shamanic tribes did. We have to embrace right. Well, we can't, it's not going to happen. So how do we make conscious, informed, compassionate decisions around that? And like you say, leadership is going to be key. But if we can use technology for to do the good things. So I, I'm going to be building my, my courses and my information and delivering them globally using, mm -hmm. uh, using technology and using all these engaging methods that people want. And that's great because those old ways can then be can be saved and they can be passed on and I can bring people in like yourself and these amazing people I meet from all over the world they can share their wisdom from their communities and from their cultures and we can we can we can share that and keep it from being lost and create humans that are 
strong and wise and compassionate. And then it's just a different way of living, isn't it? If we have efficiency through technology and the workload is distributed through machinery and AI, great. But then what do we do? We can't be redundant. We need to get back to thinking, actually, we're meant to be living our best lives over here. We'll be working within our communities and sharing whatever we share and, and doing whatever we do. We don't need to be doing all the manufacturing anymore because there's there's another there's something else for that purpose. But we do still have a purpose and identity. It might be different, but it's working out and recognizing what that is, isn't it? Um, which yeah, is difficult because exactly. our children, as then the problem is, I think our generation, my generation and above, it's it's very different having these conversations than it is with a young mind that operates very differently because they've been raised with technology. And trying to get this very old wisdom in a way that's understandable, relatable and engaging for young minds, because they are our future. You know, future generations is what we have to focus on. That, for me, is my purpose. And the kind of challenge there is trying to make these things engaging and accessible, but create that that internal locus of control and that sense of autonomy and so that better choices can be made and people recognize that they don't need to look at people's hair colors or they're opening a box of crap on social media for you to look at like stop the distractions you know it's 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 not in, it's not that it's not important because everything has importance but it's a distraction from what really what matters and what will true happiness and a fulfilled life it's 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 feeding the beast isn't it it's feeding the not so great bits no, no, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy sometimes when we have to depend on hooks to get our attention. Yeah. And it, be more self-directed. It's yeah. hard, isn't it? Because, you know, I'm kind of, and I always have been, my, my old career in fashion and media and beauty, I kind of, I feel like I'm in that space for a reason and I have to use that for the greater good, if that makes sense. I kind of... That's your core competency. <laughs> yeah, it's using it for the greater good. So I know that that's how people engage. And we can't get frustrated when we're over here doing the good stuff, saying, why are you ignoring us? Because that's not how people want to engage. And it's not where right. they're at. It's trying to find common ground and create that sense of safety to explore that, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs to explore right. self-actualization, what that looks like. And it's heartbreaking when I, you know, if I work in schools recently, when I'm I'm talking about the very basic Maslow I, people can't get past that first bit even adults and teachers it really really concerned me a few months ago when I did a creative you know sort of exploring this we'll build a pyramid we'll build a triangle a pyramid and we'll look at what we need to be our best selves and everybody could put something along the bottom house job I need oxygen I need food but nobody could conceive of anything else because that's all it's really sad and I thought oh we need to do some work here because this is really yeah. concerning that people are just waiting to be told what they need to do next they can't think about what they need to and and the safety thing we were having a conversation around psychological and emotional safety is more crucial now the physical safety is a given we know we need shelter and we know we're supposed to get a house and a mortgage and and, and a lot of people who make the decisions, I feel, the decision makers, have that's their idea of safety, is bank account safety and having the house safety and completely missing the psychological and emotional element. If people don't feel safe in their own bodies, they don't feel safe in their communities or in their schools or in their families, you can't do anything else. They can't learn. They can't, you know, be well. Mm. They can't achieve good health. So that's got to be a fundamental, really, is, is, is safety of self, isn't it? I think it's a recognition of needs and also of what how we build our assets. So you point out a very important thing. I think so much of our, not just our generation, our parents' generation, the focus has been to build up the tangible assets, the idea that somehow, you know, if we're good enough, we will work hard with or without different levels of education until oh, call it 60 65 we have saved up enough tangible assets hopefully without squandering it's like the squirrel for winter and then yeah. you have enough left over for your retirement which in times past may have been 10 15 years and then you whittle away because the average longevity was was at 75 or some countries is still 60s or is it 80 but as it turns out now at least excepting for blips like covid the mm -hmm. pandemic 
more and more people are talking about living to be a 100. 50% of our children actuarially may live to be 100, according to statistics. Because again, in Western European society in America, since World War II, they end off, each decade has seen a rise in longevity about two years or so. So the problem is, if we are 50% living to be 100, how many people could save up enough tangible assets by the age of 60, 65? So of course, the young ones are all wanting to be the next Googler, the next uh, unicorn, so that you can be a billionaire, or at least a millionaire by the age of 35. <laughs> but most people want it. Yeah, yeah, it's things, things. So I think the focus, and this is not my own idea by any means, but I really subscribe to it, is the concept of having to build up and maintain the intangible assets, not when we're ready to retire, oh, what hobby should I pick up? But really to develop it all along our lifespan. And it's our responsibility or our, uh, if you will, a privilege as parents and mentors to pass those ideas along when our children and those we have, can have a contact with when they're five, when they're certainly by 10, 15, and so forth. And the tangi intangible assets are, of course, continued education, continued connections, and interactions, plus health healthful living, back to the health aspects of nutrition, of using food as medicine rather than consuming medicine as food, of having enough sleep, of exercise, which also helps the brain, prevents Alzheimer's. So it's all one big package. We cannot be neglecting parts of it until we retire, hoping that we've provided enough. It's a dollar short and a day late so often. And for so many people, that day is not even arriving. No, they don't even get that far. And I, I think I had that revelation quite recently, really. I had that revelation probably a couple of years ago. And I've been on my journey, my, especially my, my self-development journey and my spiritual journey for many, many years since childhood. But the past two years, I've had a couple of real big penny drop moments where when I've been doing my own kind of in my shadow work, you know, I'm, I'm always, always trying to pull up the roots and, and work out why do I think like this? Why do I behave like this? What, what's going on? And I had a realization that I was doing just that. I'm because of because of the, the stuff from my childhood and what I've been taught by my community, my parents, and what you know, good girls should do and what life should be like. And I was chasing, like constantly chasing, working as hard as you possibly can for as many hours as you possibly can. Because one day, in a time that isn't now, your time might be valued. There might be something that will happen that will be nice. And I was chasing that moment that was more important than this one. And then I started to have this real crisis of oh this actually isn't right how do I move from that that way of being to actually being present and appreciating and building the in that I can experience it along the way so things like you know music is medicine for us and our family we love going to gigs and festivals and I love my garden and nature and so I made a point of starting to transition over the last couple of years so that all of the things that I would choose to do at retirement or the perception of retirement I want to do it now while I'm 45 and I've got my health and yes. I can enjoy it. So I'm trying to balance the book and do all of those things now. And I can't see me getting to a point where I stop doing what I do. Even my work and my learning and talking to you right now is a passion. And this is what I will do, and you know, forever. So I feel like I'm actually in my retirement now. Oh, good. <laughs> well, I'm planning for yeah. the retirement that will not come because exactly. you'll be engaged yes yeah because I don't want to reach a point where I am you know I'm too old to to live my life and I, <laughs> I can it me dread the thought of sitting there one day when I'm 70 going oh there you go I've achieved it what do I do now well I can't no no, no 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 yes no I want to <laughs> yeah so I'm, I'm trying to embody that and I'm trying to teach that to my kids which is really difficult because everyone's hustling aren't they and everyone's trying to make the green that's it money like you said it's the, literally yeah. the apocalypse we are we are bound by this desire or this need to, to obtain things and to have status and to you know compete and, and to have money because we have to have it to survive but I'm trying to help you know the, the people in my community and my own kids to understand actually yeah I think I messed up with that you might have seen me working 16 hours a day and burning out but I think I was probably a little mistaken and we do need to you know survive obviously but balance it out with living your life at the same time so it's yeah, yeah such wisdom to share isn't it and it's so sad to watch the way things are sometimes going and you think gosh people are caught up on that in that momentum aren't they of 
not, yes. not understanding the way the, what it is to be human. I think that for they me, mistake one, wants for needs. Now, nothing wrong yes. with certain wants, but yeah. I think really finding the right balance. And as you have said many a time, to be constantly aware. Yes. Of what we're wanting, what we're thinking. Yeah, you know, it conscious, is really being important. present. And I think when we're more present, we tend to be more satisfied, more when we're more thankful. And of course, one of the other big tasks daily is also realizing that you cannot achieve all your wants or sometimes all your needs. And being able to let go of disappointments, of shortfalls, because when we can let go and say, I'm still breathing, I'm still alive, I'm still the same self healthy, but why be miserable when you can be much more grateful? And I think the letting go and gratefulness goes hand in hand. And gratefulness is, I think, one of the most powerful self-controlling structures we have. Yeah, I agree. That most of us have much to be grateful for, even on a bad day, and not focus on the negative. Now, I'm not saying that simply thinking, oh, everything is sunshine and positive. My cancer will disappear. My, um, you know, deaths will disappear. But I think it gives us a better grounding and structure not to panic, not to delve into the wrong response which is to be dependent, to reach for what has maybe set us into the road of despair in the first place, but keeping us there in this ease, as you said. I completely agree, completely agree with you. And you probably answered one of my questions. So I had three main questions So before we do wrap up. And I'd love to talk to you again. I think we could have so many great conversations on a variety of topics. Sure, but I would love to. That would be great, it would be wonderful. But for this particular episode, I love kind of episode, it makes me feel like an influence. <laughs> Um, I've got, I've been asking everybody three questions at the end, so keep some consistency. And I think you've really just answered the first one, which is a massive big question. And I've been asking people, what, how do we change the world? How does that look? What, what can we do to change to to create that shift? So, would do you want to elaborate on that? Is there something different, or are you thinking? The sure. Whole I think to change the world, we have to know who we are, where we are, who we are, what we want to do. We cannot change the world if we don't know who we are. Yep. Perfect. That is a brilliant point. We can't. You're right. We can't. And we're always looking externally, aren't we? And trying to fix everybody else. But it's bringing it back to the individual. Yeah. Identity. Yes. Again. Beautiful. So my next question is from the, from the macro to the micro is, if, is there one little piece of information that you could give to anyone who's listening when this goes live that might help them feel better just day to day in their daily practice? Because I thought if I speak to enough people, we can build ourselves a toolkit. And if everybody gives a tip of what they do or what they you know, what helps them to feel a little bit better, then we've got this right. really good opportunity. So any any advice, anything that you think people could do? I think what I had said before, being self-aware enough to be thankful for what we have and being self-aware enough also to realize we cannot have everything. Constant, we're in what we call the dopamine nation. We're constantly wanting little hits of satisfaction, whether it be shopping, whether it be hitting on the phone, whether it be TikTok hits and so on and so forth. And our worst behavior is smoking, drinking, gambling, inappropriate relations and so forth. And part of that involves being able to be aware, but also being able to let go. If you have certain disappointments, you have to be able to let go. Now, you may have to let go of the same disappointment over and over. It could be relationships. It could be self-behavior. It could be, maybe we realize that I'm being unrealistic. I'll never be a concert pianist. I will never be a concert pianist. I'm not saying someone else won't be. You know, so being able to let go of certain dreams, if you will, somehow. Yeah. So I think those two things are daily practices that helps me, certainly. Yeah. Being thankful and being able to let go. I think that's beautiful. I think that, I mean, if anything, if we could pass that on, I think those two are the fundamental things everywhere across the globe, just gratitude and release, being able to be grateful for what we have and let go of what no longer serves us. If we could all do that, there will be a completely different place. So that is real wisdom there. Thank you for that. One more question, because for me, one of my big things is music. Music is medicine for me and my whole family. But we, we really love our music. So I thought I would create a Spotify playlist to go along with uh -huh. the podcast. So I've created a playlist called The Art of Feeling Better to go along with it. And I'm asking all my guests to pick a, a song, any song at all, that just makes you feel good. And I thought together we can all co-produce this lovely playlist. So I've had some brilliant suggestions so far and people on Facebook have been sending me ideas. So 
is there a song that if you are feeling a bit low that you would reach for and think, ah, oh, this is going to make me feel good? Well, I don't know about making me feel good, but it always brings out all the emotions. It is Leonard Cohen's singing. You know Leonard Cohen, the Canadian yeah. singer. Yes, which one? Leonard, yeah, go ahead. Hallelujah. Oh, beautiful song. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah, that really is very, that's real medicine. That's very emotive. Is really gifted musician and songwriter. And gosh, when you read the lyrics, you realize it's not quite what you're thinking. Yeah. Really clever. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's going to go straight on the playlist. There you go. Good. I'm glad to be able to contribute. That's my thankfulness of there you go. giving me this opportunity to have this conversation of being further engaged. I got to know you a little better. You got to know me a little better. And it's part of our journey of engagement. It really is. It really is. And I'm so grateful to I really am. I'm grateful to you know, the work that you're doing and for you giving me your time today. It really is that kind of energetic exchange. Oh. Lovely. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Rex. I look forward to the next session.